Legacy is not just what a fighter does in the cage. It's not even just what they do as a fighter. It's how they represent the sport, how they defined it. You can be an all-time great winner, but does that mean your legacy is concrete? Was your legitimacy ever brought into question? Have you been a detriment to the sport? The fighters we're looking at today were not just great champions, but have embodied mixed martial arts. They've given back to the sport as much as they took from it, redefining MMA in many ways and being representatives the sport can look proudly on. These are the fighters you would struggle to find flaws in, as it pertains to their body of work and how they carry themselves throughout their careers and beyond. Keep in mind, this is not a list of the best champions, but the ones who put it all together in the cage as well as outside of it. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and these are the 10 most concrete fighter legacies. Number 10, Frank Shamrock. Often buried by the UFC for disputes with the brass, Frank Shamrock really doesn't get anywhere near the credit he deserves for what he was able to do as a fighter. He is the first ever to have won belts in the WEC, UFC, and Strike Force, the first ever UFC light heavyweight champion, a belt he would defend four times before leaving the organization. He was the interim king of Pan Crace with victories over Boss Rutan, Suzuki, and Funaki. He has wins over Ensign Inoue, Jeremy Horn, and Tito Ortiz. He started the first ever cross training MMA gym after leaving the Lions Den and teaming up with Maurice Smith, a true mixed martial artist. Something that also goes uncredited often is how much he helped launch Strike Force, main eventing the first show against Caesar Gracie in 2006, and he was a big part of their early success, having high profile main events with Kung Lee and Nick Diaz. For his contributions to the evolution of the sport alone, Shamrock deserves consideration for this list. But when you also factor in what he did in Pan Crace, his place as an all time great UFC champion of his era, as well as what he was able to do for budding organizations after he left, Frank's legacy in the sport is one that's often overlooked, but is as concrete as any of the best to ever do it. Number 9. Boss Rutan Another fighter often forgotten by modern fans, Boss Rutan was a pioneer who was not only an incredible competitor, a former King of Pancrase and UFC heavyweight champion, controversial decision over Randleman aside, but he was so much more than his victories. He paved the way in the early 90s for the modern athletes we see today. In terms of both the evolution of his abilities and the charisma he carried throughout his legendary career as both a fighter and a commentator, while his record in Pancrase of 25-4-1 carries important losses, the growth in his game is what is truly remarkable. Coming in as a pure striker, one that would find it in those early days with his incredible kicks and liver shots, Rutan did everything in his ability to learn the submission game, eventually getting 14 career subs to his 11 KO TKOs. After he was defeated by Ken Shamrock for King of Pan Crace in 1995, he would never lose a single bout again for the rest of his career. 20 fights straight, that's a hell of a run. With victories over Minoru Suzuki, Guy Mezger, Maurice Smith twice, and Frank Shamrock twice, Boss was one of the defining talents of Pan Crace. While it's become the norm these days for fighters to end their careers and hop on the mic, Rutan was truly a pioneer in that regard as well, and one of the best to ever do it. His charisma garnered him mainstream interest in MMA at a time where that was pretty scarce. Rutan is a defining figure of his era and rightfully finds himself on this list. Number 8. Chuck Liddell at such a crucial junction in the history of mixed martial arts, that time period between 2004 and 2006, when the UFC finally came into its own as a power in the sport, truly breaking through in the US market, something that would lead us down a road to ESPN and mainstream sports culture, Chuck Liddell was the embodiment of the organization. And the sport couldn't have asked for somebody better to introduce MMA to so many through his title reign and the ultimate fighter, which he would coach. Chuck is so much more than his career stats, although those are impressive as hell too. Held back by Tito Ortiz's star early in his career, Liddell's eight-fight win streak in the UFC before he would get his shot at gold, absolutely fantastic, with wins over Jeff Munson, Kevin Randleman, Guy Mesker, Marilla Bustamante, Vitor Belfort, and Hanato Sabral. Not only was he an impressive fighter, he was an entertaining one. His whole persona, the mohawk, the way he carried himself, truly a man of ice you might say. Oh yeah, and he knocked people the fuck out, still holling the record for the light heavyweight division for most KOTKOs at 10. It was a shock when he lost the interim title fight to Randy Couture at UFC 43, but look how he bounced back after returning from Pride. He finally got to beat up Tito, twice at 47 and 66. He would take the title from Couture, defeat him twice, have four successful title defenses, and really make an argument during his time as the best light heavyweight in the world, something that wasn't always UFC champion in those early days. He would eventually defeat Vanderlei Silva after his title reign, and then go on to work in the back office of the UFC for years, continuing to be a fantastic ambassador for the sport. Now, very recently he was involved in a domestic incident, but it would appear that he was the one that was assaulted, and all charges were dropped. Chuck Liddell defined American MMA in the early 2000s, and and carried the sport here in the US through its most crucial growth period. Number 7. Jose Aldo 
it's definitely not easy putting currently active fighters on this list, but the three that do appear are so solid that it honestly doesn't matter what happens the rest of their careers going forward, and Jose Aldo is an exceptional example for that group. The King of Rio is literally a living legend, still kicking ass at 35 years old, which okay, isn't old at all, but his 35 has a bit more miles than most. Even so, he's on a three-fight win streak against top-tier talent with a solid number three spot in the bantamweight division. When you consider all he's done before, the fact he is where he is right now is impressive as hell. The man was a defining figure of the WEC, especially at featherweight, where he would win eight fights in a row, the most in the promotion's history, as well as enter the UFC as its final divisional champ, having defeated the likes of Cub Swanson, Mike Brown, and Uriah Faber. Upon entering the UFC, Aldo would go on a seven-fight run, defending his title each and every time to earn the most consecutive and all-time wins for any champion in that division. He essentially had nine defenses in all, something that may never be replicated. If you argued he's the greatest featherweight ever, you certainly wouldn't be insane for saying so. In the UFC, he beat Kenny Florian, Chad Mendez twice, Frankie Edgar twice, Korean Zombie. It's a solid list. After his shocking 13-second loss to Conor at UFC 194, he bounced back and won the title again. I think because of the McGregor defeat, as well as his duo of bouts with Max Holloway, some fans began to question the legitimacy of his featherweight goat status. However you feel, he's certainly in the conversation, and in my opinion, he's the one. An all-time great Brazilian representative of the sport, he's always classy in victory or defeat. There will never be another King of Rio. Number 6. Amanda Nunes I never could have imagined when this list was conceptualized that Amanda Nunes' inclusion could somehow be controversial. But with recent events, her loss to Juliana Pena at UFC 289, some have begun to question her legacy. If I may, let me explain to you why that would be like saying Anderson Silva was never a great champion after he was KO'd by Chris Weidman. I mean, the fact that so many are calling Pena's victory the greatest upset of all time is a testament to how highly Nunes and her career has been regarded. She has had seven successful title defenses, potentially more to come. Let us not forget she was the double champion when defeated by Pena. She only lost her bantamweight crown. She is the first female double champ. She has the most UFC wins of any female fighter, the most title victories, the most knockouts and stoppages at bantamweight, the longest win streak of any female fighter, has victories over six former or current champions. And this is all after coming into the UFC at seven and three. She was nine and four when she was defeated by Kat Singano. Then she moved to American Top Team and went on a 13 fight run of dominance before being defeated by Pena. Again, that's the longest of any female fighter in UFC history. History. It also ties Habib, GSP, Max Holloway, and Demetrius Johnson for fourth all-time ever. She beat Jermaine Durandamy, Holly Holm, Misha Tate, Valentina Shevchenko, Ronda Rousey, Chris Cyborg. So yes, despite how many might feel in the moment about her defeat, to pretend her legacy is not concrete is absolutely disingenuous. And that's not even factoring in how great she's been as an ambassador for the sport and a representative in the mainstream for the LGBTQ community. If Nunez never wins another fight, her place as an all-time great is etched in stone. Number 5. Demetrius Johnson the most consecutive title defenses in UFC history. What more do you need to say about his legacy? In an organization that's been considered the best of the best for a long time now, Demetrius Johnson put his title on the line against every single opponent that had a rightful claim to number one contendership in the division, and he defeated them. Even the man who would eventually dethrone him in a very close split decision, might I add, he already held a victory over, Henry Cejudo. There's somehow been this notion that Johnson fought cans his whole career, as if there were better flyweights in the world that he just wasn't competing against. Two wins over Joe Benavidez and John Dotson, he defeated Kyoji Horiguchi, Wilson Hayes, Ali Baga Utinov, Ian McCall, and yeah, Triple C. He defined flyweight. He carried it on his back for years and got shit for it the whole time, but he kept on trucking. The guy's a technical marvel. One of the most disciplined and strategic fighters that's ever stepped the cage or ring. He's been all class from day one. He's everything you would want a representative of the sport to be. And his legacy isn't even done being formed. He won one's flyweight Grand Prix, and even though he came up short in his title fight, there's a very good chance he could win that down the line and I have no doubt he'll continue to add to his already incredible resume. But what he did in the UFC alone is more than enough for him to earn a spot on our list. There's been a lot of UFC champions, and not a single one can say they had 11 title defenses in a row. Number 4. Habib Nurmagomedov he may have left us wanting more, but what he did when he competed is more than enough to be considered one of the most concrete fighters in MMA history. Habib Nurmagomedov was basically born into fighting. He grew up from day one in a combat sports environment, and that is something you cannot catch up with. You cannot teach. The man literally lived in a gym. In his 29 straight victories, he rose up to the very top of the lightweight division and appeared essentially unbeatable. And while some have knocked him for leaving too early, that certainly shouldn't be a detriment to his legacy when you look at the body of work he had. Yes, 30-0, 
would have been great, but 29-0 is pretty damn ridiculous. And when you consider he should have had his title shot when he was 23-0, but had it stolen from him at UFC 205, the man's legacy would have likely carried even more weight if given the opportunity. But still, ending your run as lightweight champion, tying Penn, Edgar, and Henderson for the most defenses in the division's history, and beating Connor, Dustin, and Gaethje on your way out, that's damn impressive. Of course, it would have been nice to see the Tony Ferguson fight, but that 13 victory streak, the longest in lightweight history, is absolutely amazing any way you look at it. He is Russian MMA still as a retired fighter. He took that torch from Fedor, and he's represented the sport as well as anybody. Habib may have left us wanting just a bit more, but his 29 victories leave him with a legacy very few will ever be able to get anywhere near. Number 3. Randy Couture Captain America, what a fucking legend. Randy Couture is the sport of mixed martial arts. His list of accomplishments is just ridiculous. UFC 13 tournament winner, three-time heavyweight champion, two-time champion at 205, first multi-divisional champion ever, the only one to win a title back after losing it, the most total championship fights in UFC history, the most title fights, the most reigns at six. He has the most main events in UFC history. And all of this while being an old guy, he started late. He's the oldest fighter to become a first time champion, to be a champion period, to defend a title, and to even get a win in the UFC. He was so vital to the growth of the sport in the US, as I touched on a bit in the Chuck entry, their rivalry and that first season of tough as coaches, so important. He's everything you would want to represent this sport in both his fighting and how he carried himself in all aspects. The fact he's been banned from the UFC is really a tragedy because he's one of the best to ever enter the organization in terms of talent and his behavior as a champion, as a fighter, as a representative of MMA. His his spats with the UFC brass are honestly something that showed future talent a pretty good blueprint for looking out for yourself as an independent contractor in a sport where fighters are so often at the whims of the promoters. From heavyweight to light heavyweight to heavyweight and back again to 205, the amazing journey that Randy Couture went on as a top tier talent in mixed martial arts has firmly cemented his legacy all time in both the cage and outside of it. Number 2. Fedor Emelianenko but for the unfortunate illegal accidental elbow that ended his fight with Kosaka in the first 17 seconds via doctor stoppage, Fedor Emelianenko essentially went on a 32-fight win streak, and he avenged that loss to Kosaka later. Let's get real, he wasn't winning that fight, the cut is the only reason he got the victory. Unbeaten in a division for an entire decade. To win 32 fights without a legitimate loss, it's ridiculous. And we're not talking about somebody amassing such an insane record on the regional scene either. Starting in rings where he would become the openweight champion and the 2001 Absolute Class Tournament winner, to Pride FC, where he was the three-time heavyweight champion and the 2004 heavyweight world Grand Prix winner, at a time when Pride was hands down the best organization in the world, especially at heavyweight. Then beyond that, through his Whamma title afterwards and wins against two former UFC champions that defined the era they were in, Tim Sylvia and Andre Arlovsky. And when I say wins, I mean he completely embarrassed both of them. Sure, there were some weird freak show fights thrown in there, guys that had no business fighting Fedor, but his wins over top-tier talent speak for themselves. Kaz Fujita, Ricardo Orona, Hanato Sabral, Semi Schilt, Big Nog twice when he was the best in the world, Mirko Krokop, UFC champions Mark Coleman twice, Kevin Randleman, Matt Lindland. His legacy is completely bulletproof. Yes, 34 fights later, he did finally get beat by future champion Fabrizio Verdum, all time legend Dan Henderson, and Bigfoot, which was a doctor stoppage. But look at what he's done since. It's pretty damn impressive that at 45 years old, he's doing what he's doing in Bellator. That KO of Tim Johnson was impressive as hell for his age, and he did fight for the title in that organization. If he was given another shot, for his final fight, there wouldn't be too many objections. Fedor defined a decade. He was the Michael Jordan of mixed martial arts. He has always been a shining example of sportsmanship and calm under pressure, a gem in the MMA crown, someone this community should be proud of all time. Number 1. George St. Pierre when I think of an athlete that best represents MMA, that defines it in a way that anybody could and should be proud of, there is not a name that comes up quicker in my mind than George St. Pierre. He is so much more than his fighting, and we'll get to that very soon, but I think it's important to acknowledge how well GSP carried himself and was an ambassador to the sport over the course of his incredible career, wearing suits to press conferences when that really wasn't a thing in MMA. The way he did interviews showed class to his opponents. He never took the low road, except maybe that one Matt Hughes line, but look at how much St. Pierre regrets that. You thought he kicked a kid in the face with how awful he felt later on. He's what we call class. He is the example of what you would want a champion to be and a representative of your organization. He's also proof you don't need to be a dick to be popular. Now let's talk about what he did in the cage because oh my god. Two division champion, nine defenses at welterweight, he has the most title fights, title wins, and divisional wins at 170 pounds in the UFC, the second most all-time wins with 13, the most takedowns in UFC history, and then look at the talent this man defeated. Matt Hughes twice, BJ Penn 
Penn twice, Josh Koscheck twice, Jake Shields, Carlos Condit, Nick Diaz, Johnny Hendricks. I know that one's controversial, but the man's not a judge, okay? He walked away the greatest welterweight ever because he needed that time for him. Came back and won the middleweight title for Michael Bisbean four years later. Two career losses ever, both avenged fully. If you made an argument that he's the greatest fighter ever, it's not the worst take. But when it comes to the overall picture, to how concrete his legacy is when you consider everything, not just fighting, he is in a class of his own. A big, big thank you to Ben Rosette, who provided that sweet tune you heard in the intro. Check out his music by clicking the link in the description and go give him a follow on his Instagram and Twitter page, at Ben Rosette. Huge shout out to the legendary once and future King Tomas Welsh for editing this video together. Follow him on Instagram, at Big Beat Visual. That's beat as in the band from Doug and not a forceful strike. Thanks for watching. Please give us a like and subscribe. We've got three new videos or more for you every single week. Let us know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Follow On Point MMA on Twitter and have yourself a wonderful day.